All right, we apologize. We are a little late <laughs> when we started to go live. You know how technology is. It will choose just that moment to um, cop out on us. But I think we have our things sorted out and we are glad that you can join us. So thank you for joining us online today. We recognize that this is has been a strange week for most of us and not only strange but sometimes even challenging but we're trusting that it was also a good week because you're able to lean on the lord and find him to be your source and your strength and that you found him to be able to do more than you could ask or think and we're glad that you're with us this morning because our prayer is that this service this time of worship would be one that would just encourage your hearts and would focus our attention again on our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so welcome to our service online. And then we're going to ask you to just join me in prayer. We have been praying for you throughout this week, and we want to just pray together um, in this service. So if you would join me, let us pray. Father, again, we come to you and thank you for who you are. And we thank you that you are the almighty, unchanging God. And that even in the midst of our crises and our struggles, we can lean on you. And Lord, we pray especially for every person, not just in our country, but across our world, who has been affected by this virus. And Lord, we know that today there are some families who are grieving because they have lost loved ones. Mm -hmm. And we pray for your grace and your comfort for them. You would minister to them in ways way beyond any human being could. Mm -hmm. Lord, we know there are some who are suffering right now because they have been infected mm -hmm. by this virus. And we would ask you for grace. We would ask you for strength. We would ask you for comfort and healing. Mm -hmm. And we pray that you would be with their caregivers and you would just give wisdom and you would provide for every need, every resource they would need to battle through this thing. We pray that you would provide it. And then, Lord, we pray for families and caregivers who are helping folks who are ill to, to battle through this difficult time, this trying season in our lives, that you'll give them grace and patience and you'll protect them also from um, being infected themselves. And then, Lord, we pray for other folks on the front line, um, people in, in the medical care industry, people also trying to keep other industries going so we can have some measure of normalcy to our lives. We pray you'll protect them and you would um, just continue to keep them strengthened for you. And we also lift up leaders who are making decisions about how this crisis is being managed. Lord, give them wisdom that is way beyond any human earthly wisdom. We pray you would show them how to make the best decisions. And then we pray that all of us would do our part in helping to stem the flow and the development of this virus and this disease across our lands. And Lord, we would ask you that in this time, above all else, you would draw our attention to you because you are God and you love us. And this situation didn't take you by surprise. And so we pray that you'll help us to lean hard on you and find you to be our God, our all-sufficient God. And we ask you to take this time of worship and you would that you would use it for your honor and for your glory, and you would minister to our hearts through the power of your spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to invite Candice to come at this time, and she will sing. Good morning. At a time like this, I know sometimes people are a little fearful and anxious. And I wanted to just encourage you from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 and 26. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet... Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? I am so thankful that the God that we serve is constantly watching over us, and I know he will take care of us. May this song be a blessing and an encouragement to your heart. feel discouraged 
And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven? Thank you, Candice. What a powerful reminder of the reality that God watches over us. And even in that song, he says, 
I sing because I'm happy. And I can sing because I am free. And we are going to look a little bit today as we turn our attention to the Word of God. We want to look a little bit on what our responses have been and can be in a time of crisis like ours. I suspect that there have been many people who have experienced different kinds of emotions as we respond to this time. Perhaps some of you have gotten depressed because, yeah, things are depressing, right? You have to be locked in. And um, for some of you, this extra enforced time with family can either be a blessing or a burden. And for some of you, even if you are alone, it can also be a blessing or a burden. And so, you know, you may be like, whoa, this is, this is difficult. Some of us may have gotten a little angry as we have seen things that we have not been able to achieve or accomplish or access to. Maybe we don't like how things are going and are being handled. And so we can have all kinds of responses. Some of us have just adopted a kind of stoic attitude to say, well, whatever will be, will be. I'll just try to talk it out. But I want to draw your attention to a gentleman who centuries ago faced an immense crisis in his life and in his nation's life. And his response was markedly different from what, what we might be tempted to do today. In fact, for some of us, his response would seem almost crazy and weird. In the midst of all the struggle and pain and hurt, this man was experiencing joy. Yeah, you heard me right, joy. And I know that might sound a little obscene to say, who can be joyful in a time of just such hurt and pain? But, but let me say this to you. You and I will find out that where we are, not just physically, but mentally and more so spiritually, is going to have a profound impact on how we will weather this crisis and how we will not only be just um, survivors, but we can turn around and be people who can be helpers of others as they wrestle through this time. And I want to ask you to go back with me centuries to the nation of Israel, to a time when Israel had wandered away from God and they were experiencing some difficult times. And there was one prophet that God sent to them at you and his name was Habakkuk. And tucked away in this little book that he wrote, we find an amazing response to his time of crisis. And I want to ask us to just study, evaluate what this man did to see if maybe there are some lessons in there for us. Maybe God can use his experience to speak to our lives today. I am going to begin at the end of the book. And then we'll back up a little bit and just take some of the ideas um, out of it. Habakkuk chapter 3. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 17. Listen to this. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the folds, and there be no herd in the stars. Just take a moment and let that description sink into your soul. Here is a man who's looking at utter devastation. He's looking around him and the things he would have taken for granted, the things he would have depended on, they have been ripped out of his life. There is no social safety net. There is no bank account sitting in the back. He's not even sure how his needs are, his needs are going to be met for today. And with that in mind, look verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. The choir master with string instruments. He actually wrote this as a song. And you ask yourself, where do you find time or reason to sing songs of joy in situations like these. I mean, I could understand if he wrote the blues, right? And he was just saying, you know, nobody knows the troubles I see. But instead, he says, I am finding joy in God. 
And let me ask you, how do you get to a place like this in your life that in the midst of real challenge and real struggles, you can be at a place where joy still fills your heart? These are some issues we need to wrestle with, not only in times of crises. There are some realities about this man's life that's critical for us in our day-to-day -day lives. But many times, we don't get to the place where we wrestle with these issues until we're in a crisis and we have to think through what's going on. And so I want to share with you three realities that can bring us to a place of joy nevertheless. And that's the theme of my sermon this morning, joy nevertheless. And um, we're saying in spite of our circumstances, we can have a deep inner joy that sustains us and even helps us to be effective servants of others, not just survivors of the crisis. Habakkuk didn't start in this place of joy. Actually, when we first meet him, he's expressing some amount of frustration. He's expressing frustration because he's coming to grips with a truth that all of us need to come to grips with. And the first truth he has to come to grip with, grips with is that life can be tough. Life can be tough. Where do we get that? When we meet Habakkuk in the first chapter of Habakkuk and his first few verses, Habakkuk is not crazy. In fact, Habakkuk is strange among the prophets because most of the prophets speak for God. Habakkuk is speaking to God, and he's not happy. <laughs> Listen to him in verse 2. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not say? Why do you make me to see iniquity? Why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth for verity. In Habakkuk's time, the nation of Israel had deteriorated to the point where there was all kinds of rampant injustice. And Habakkuk's righteous spirit couldn't stand it. And he longed for something to happen. And when he looked around him, he said, you know what? Life is tough because there are all kinds of unfair and unjust circumstances. May I say to you today that um, as we have been invaded by this invisible enemy, many of us will ask ourselves, well, why is my family touched by it? Why am I touched by it? Why are we in this situation that we don't seem to be able to control? Life is tough. Circumstances have changed. Some of us can't go to work. Some of you are facing financial issues. You're not even sick. You could work, but you're not allowed to go. And you're saying, man, this, this is tough. Those of you who just want to go out and have fun, tough it out. <laughs> but for those who are having real struggles, we, we understand that. And then, not only is life tough, because there are times when we face unpleasant circumstances, but here's what makes it even more difficult, especially for those of us who are people of faith. Sometimes we face the reality of unanswered prayers. Habakkuk said, God, I'm crying out to you, but you are not answering, you're not doing anything. Have you been there? <laughs> Maybe even this very week, you have gone to God in fervent prayer. You've been praying for change, and what you see is nothing. And you're asking yourself, does God even care? And some of us are crying out to God, God, I have been praying. You're not even answering me. What are we to do? Listen, it's one thing to be in a situation where life is hard. But to have the assurance that I can call out to God and he responds immediately. But what happens when he does not respond immediately? What do you do? Hey, one of the realities in life is that sometimes God does not answer when we expect him to answer. And that's a reality we just have to live with. You ask me, Pastor, I thought you were talking about joy nevertheless. I am. But we need to deal with the realities because Habakkuk is not a crazy guy who just does not pretend there's nothing bad happening. He is facing reality that, you know what, life is tough. And sometimes when I cry out to God, I don't hear from him. But... This is where he begins. The next step he takes makes things even a little more difficult still. Because it's one thing to pray to God and not get an answer. But sometimes it's even more difficult to get an answer that we do not want. 
So Habakkuk has prayed to God and said, God, you're doing nothing. And in, in, in chapter 1, and beginning in verse 5 through 11, God answers Habakkuk. God says to him, Habakkuk, I have some news that you won't like. Verse 5, he says, look among the nations and see, wonder and being astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Here's what God says. Things are going to get worse. You think it's bad now? I am allowing the Chaldeans to come into Judah and Jerusalem and to overrun it. And the Chaldeans were not kind people. They were a vicious army. And they were going to ravage Judah. And God says to Habakkuk, I know things are bad, but they're going to get worse. That's not what anybody wants to hear. You know, right now, I listen as um, folks try to encourage us in the news media and try to help us through these difficult times. And You know, folks are saying, you know, we will get better, we'll get through this. And I'm sure we will in time. But part of the news too is that, you know what, things are going to get worse before they get better. None of us wants to hear that. That's not my ideal news, but guess what? It is the reality. And we have to be able to access reality and deal with it. And here's part of the reality. Not only will things get worse globally, things can deteriorate. Life can be, be difficult sometimes and things can get worse. Not only globally, but sometimes things which haven't touched us personally will get into our own lives. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for myself that we ourselves will not be personally afflicted by the COVID-19 disease. But I can't give you any guarantee. I can't even give myself any guarantees. Sure, I'm taking all the precautions. We're self-isolated. We're washing our hands until they're, they're almost going to be raw. And you know, you're doing all the stuff that you should do. And you're sanitizing everything over and over. But there are no guarantees. Things could get worse. And some of you are saying, so okay, Pastor, you've managed to just depress me even more. Hold on. I want to take you now as Hosea is journeying. And he's been looking on his circumstances. He's been listening that things could get worse. But God begins to talk to him about who God is and what God is doing. And God says to um, Habakkuk, things are not out of control. I have a program and a plan and I'm working through it. I know things are hard now, but there is a proper outcome, a glorious triumphant outcome in the end. And as Habakkuk begins to take his eyes of his circumstances a bit and begin to adjust his perspective and begins to look at God, something begins to happen in his heart. I don't believe this is something he had to force or if he had to try to make himself do. It is a natural outcome of putting your attention on God. It doesn't mean that you lose sight of all the difficulties around us, but it means your perspective changes. Because remember when we read verse 17, Habakkuk says, of chapter 3 now, in chapter 3, verse 17, Habakkuk says, things are still tough. The fig trees haven't uh, blossomed. The vine hasn't brought forth anything. There, there are no, there, there's nothing in the field. The animals have been killed. I have no resources. Life is still hard. But then he, he brings up that amazing word, yet. Nevertheless, in the midst of all of this, he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer, deer's feet. He makes me tread on my high places. You know, one of the things we may not get immediately as we look in this passage in verses 18 and 19 is how uh, Habakkuk stresses who God is. In these two verses, he uses different names of God to refer to God. If you, if you look in your English Bibles, you'll notice in verse 18 that the word Lord is in small caps. Large, uh, there are caps with small caps. You'll notice the God is in our regular, um, normal way we would write, capital G, O, D. Look at verse 19. God, again, is in small caps. And then Lord is in you know, the mix, regular, regular way would write it, capital N, lowercase. And you're like, well, 
why, why are we doing all these changes? Because this was how the translators of our English version tried to let us know that there were different Hebrew words which are being used for God. And as, as Habakkuk is dealing with this situation, he's coming to grips with who God is. And he's talking about the different names of God. One of the names there is Jehovah, Yahweh, I am that I am. This is the eternal God that we're dealing with. And so Habakkuk is saying, I'm facing a situation in my life and in my time which is unprecedented for me. Have you heard that word before? Over and over in the news media we're hearing, this is an unprecedented situation, at least in our lifetimes. Maybe some of our older folks have said, are saying, well, we've been through stuff like this. But for most of us, this is unprecedented. The, the word that is being used to describe the virus is novel. It's a new thing for us. Can I tell you something? Our God is the eternal God. God is abandoning the road, unprecedented in heaven, trying to figure out, oh man, this is not what are we doing with this? When, when Habakkuk stepped back and he's looking at his circumstances, he said, but hold on, I have a God who is eternal God, who is very, very intimately aware of what is going on. And listen, it's great to look to God and know who God is, that he's the eternal God. Not only he's the eternal God, but we, 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 another word here is the God of speaks to the God of power. The God who has the ability to do what needs to be done. And it's, it's amazing to us that with this invisible virus that we're fighting, at this stage, we don't have any therapies for it. We're hoping we'll get some. But can I tell you something? Our God is a God who has all the resources that we need, not only materially, but more so spiritually, that can anchor us in this time. And Habakkuk was reminded afresh that this is the God I'm dealing with. And then one other idea here with the names of God that I have accused is that God is a God who is a Lord, Master. He is in control. You know, sometimes it's hard to wrap our minds around this idea of God being in control when things go wrong in our world. One of the realities we must remember is that we are living in a broken world, a world that has been broken by sin. And sin has horrible consequences. It does not mean that God isn't working his program out, but it means that there are times when we are still going to have to live through the consequences of our fallenness. But we can remember and we can be sure that we serve a God who is eternal, who is powerful, and who is in control. That brings security to me. Comfort to me, assurance. I know things are not just spinning out of control and we don't know what is going on. Somebody who knows is at, is at the help of my life and of this world. But here's something else. Not only is Habakkuk reminded of who God is, but he's reminded of, who, of what God does. Notice what he says. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, who he is. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God is a God who saves, who delivers, who rescues. And there are two levels on which I want to just speak to you about on this. Yeah, one is when we face difficult circumstances, we can look to God to rescue us, to extract us out of the situations, or to even change our circumstances. But may I speak to you about a deeper level of salvation that God, God addresses to? In the same way that we can't really see the coronavirus, all of us, Every person born in this world, according to the testimony of the scriptures, is affected by a condition that we can't really see or touch, but we can see the effects. It's called sin. And ultimately, sin is a killer because it will separate us from God for all eternity. But God has provided a way for us to be saved from the effects of sin. Our God is a God of salvation. He's provided his son, Jesus Christ. And in a few weeks, we'll be celebrating Easter. When Christ died, the time we commemorate the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of us. And that is the ultimate salvation. The knowledge that no matter what happens to our bodies, our eternal souls are secure in our Lord Jesus Christ. And Habakkuk recognized that. He said, God is the God of my salvation, my deliverance. And it's not only material deliverance. Because let me tell you something. Habakkuk knew that Jerusalem and Judah would, would be overrun. But still, God was a God of salvation. So not only does he say, um, I, I put my trust in God because God is my salvation. God not only saves, but here's what something else God does. 
God the Lord is my strength. God strengthens. So there are times when we have to go through some difficult circumstances, but God says, when you go through those circumstances, I will be with you. I will equip you to stand. And I, and I encourage you today to, to lean on God's strength. You know, you know, um, Habakkuk continues and says, he makes my feet like the deers. And I'm saying this to you, it didn't really have meaning to me until we, we, we moved here to the U.S., my wife and I, and we lived in a community where deer tended to be around the area. And um, it's funny how these deer, you know, would behave. There are times when we'd be walking, and we're in this area where it's not really very built up, and so they're there in the bushes. And then when the deer realized that we were there, walking along and they got aware of our presence, those deer would just take off over the rocky, rocky terrain and they would be like just sprinting as if they were running on real smooth ground and like, what? You know, they didn't really, I just stop, I just stop and watch it amazing. They're darting over these rough places as if it's nice smooth ground. I tell you something, if I tried that, I would be in all kinds of broken pieces all over the place. And so when, when, when Habakkuk says, God is going to make my feet like the deer feet, he's saying, listen, God is going to enable me to go through the rocky, difficult times and navigate them well because God is my strength. Don't you want some strength today? Don't you want the assurance that, that God is here and God is with me? Well, here's, here's the reality of the situation. Habakkuk could say all these things and could respond in joy because one, he had anchored his life in God. May I say to you that right now in this crisis, anchor your hope in God. It's not just, we, we, we know that our authorities and experts are doing everything they can to help to fight this epidemic. But, but may I ask you to put your hope and your trust in God in this difficult time because if you're anchored in the Lord, it prevents you from being destroyed by an onslaught of emotions and responses that just dishonor God and make things harder for you. And so I want to call you to say, you know what? Just like um, Habakkuk says, I rejoice in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. That phrase is repeated over and over. If God is your anchor, not just whatever physical barriers you're using to and your social distance you're observing, you should do all of those. But your anchor is in God. And then not only do you anchor your life in God, but you should center your life in God. And you ask, what's the difference there? Well, you know what? An anchor keeps us stable, secure, especially in times of difficulties. So our ships don't get washed away. But when we center our lives around God, it is saying that as I live, whether it's a crisis or not, what matters to me most is God. My life is built in a personal relationship with a God who loves me. He's my God. He goes with me through life. He goes through me in the good times. He goes with me through the bad times. And when our lives are centered on God, we discover that we can really find joy, nevertheless. So my prayer is that you will find this joy in God, this relationship with God, that makes you more than a survivor. It will turn you not just in a survivor, but into a servant. Because you can now turn around and with joy, go back to the difficult circumstances of your life. The people you need to um, help and um, the circumstances you need to weather. You can go back to God and say, Lord, here am I. Give me grace in these circumstances. I pray that as you lean on the Lord, you'll see a change. Significant change in how you face life. In how you respond. And how you reach out to the folks around you who could use a word of encouragement at this time. May God give you joy, nevertheless. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you so much that you are our God. And we thank you that when we are weak, you are strong. We thank you that you're our strength. We thank you that you're our Savior. We thank you that you are the Almighty God. And we stand ready to respond to any who would lean on you. We ask you that in this time, many of us, many, many of us would turn to you, would anchor our lives and our faith in you, would center our lives around you. And we would find that when we do that, we can't help ourselves. Even when we hurt, there's an underlying assurance of what you're doing, of who you are. And Lord, yes, 
you can even find joy despite your struggles and your challenges. So we cast ourselves upon you through the strong name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So let me just ask you if you would like us to be praying for you. We would love to. We have a group of folks who pray weekly for requests that are sent in to us. And there are two ways you can get your requests to us. One is you can email them to us. Um, if you go to our church's website, you can see a contact form. You can submit it through that, or you can just email us at mountainstreamchurch at gmail.com. Or you can just direct message us on um, Facebook and we will we will add you to our prayer list. Uh, we are trusting that God will give you every grace and every strength for this time. And as you go back to your lives, go with the assurance that God is with you. And if we can be of any help to you at all, please feel free to reach out to us. I've asked Daniel if he would close out our time here with a song. So this has done a ministry to our heart to song.
I will praise you in the storm. 